And uh, welcome to uh, Scottish Independence, maybe it's I, maybe it's not. And uh, it's an absolutely delight to be back here in the Accidental Theatre, uh, courtesy of Imagine Belfast, an absolutely terrific festival, it's great to be here. And I was looking through the festival brochure and I was looking at the names like Dom Chomsky, uh, George Monbiot and John Otway, for those of us of a certain generation, thinking, you know, the only person I don't know in this brochure is me. <laughs> and I thought to, to actually just kick off tonight, uh, we'll do one of... Oh, well, one of your own, actually, Leslie Riddick, uh, who's here. It's we're the, the team that does the Leslie Riddick podcast, uh, a podcast on uh, Scottish and international politics with Dasha culture thrown in. And we just thought I'd do a wee bit intro just to say who we are. And uh, you may be trying to figure out uh, why Peter O'Neill and the folk at Imagine Belfast actually invited us to do this, and we're delighted to be here. Yeah, well, um, it just uh, I'm Leslie Riddick. I, I was brought up in Belfast. Um, I went to... Belmont, Strandtown and Strathurn, since these are all relevant things in your mind immediately. So actually, posh prod, yep, fine. In fact, it's worse than that, sort of semi-posh Presbyterian. That's how specific it was, you know what it's like. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I did say before that um, my family are, are Highlanders. Um, they come from Caithness and a road junction in Banffshire. That was an exciting holiday, I'll tell you. Um, but. At the age of 11, they broke it to us when we were here that we'd actually been born in Wolverhampton. <laughs> which was a bit of a shocker, you know? You thought you knew where you were. Okay, you were sort of not properly Northern Irish if you had Scottish parents and, you know, it was all Presbyterians around you. But to then discover the small detail of birth, which means I can't get a Northern Irish passport, but anyway. <laughs> so, um, we left in 1973. Um, you know, things didn't look like they were going to change. My family were not essentially from here originally, and um, they just decided I mean, to leave. I was utterly distraught, but um, then moved to Scotland and have been a broadcaster, got involved with many things, laterally, particularly independence. Um, so I was quite involved in the 2014 campaign, quite upset when it went nowhere quite having to learn very quickly about how you set yourself back up on your feet. Um, how you begin to look at the longer term, how you try to persuade people who are very uncertain about their own capacity. And this would be true, I think, of all Celts, actually, but, but I'll just talk for the Scots, is we could be sitting with a humdinger of a proposition. You know, never mind the currency and all that for a minute, because it's a bit like moving home. You know, if you want to move home, you'll probably find a removals van. But actually, at the moment, we're only talking about the price of the removals van. We haven't decided if we want to move home. That's the big discussion and decision we made to, to make, and the rest will follow. So do we, do we think that we've got a better opportunity running the place ourselves? You know, people will think on the one hand, sort of pretty automatically, look at yesterday, Boris Johnson, it's just like you're having an actual giraffe. But at the same token, there's that terrible fear of the people who've been told essentially for such a long time that they're kind of pretty marginal. It's not just that they've told, they've learnt it through their very life experience handed on and on and on. They've learnt to become good second-class citizens. We are like the permanent secretaries of the peace. And to decide that you're going to be someone who moves from the reserve bench to actually being, if you like, captain of the team, it's your dream and it's your terror at the same time. So we've got to be able to deal with some of this because we can't harple on like this. Whether it's ju just devolution, whether it's going for independence, there is nothing wrong with Scotland. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with Scots. We're sitting in a humdinger, peachy, peachy country. And as I was saying earlier, you know, when people start talking about, oh, but the rain, you think, we've got water even. We've got water. I mean, it is actually gold dust these days. Look ahead. The, the reports are that the south of England will run out of water in 30 years. One of Boris's wheezes in 2014 that didn't even get off the you know, drawing board was to have a conduit taking water from the south of Scotland right down to the south of England via the Severn. I mean, you know, if you're looking in terms of resources, a resource-rich country like Scotland is freaking laughing. And still people are finding a wee thing in the corner that's a bit problematic. And the big problem, really, is just not being sure about the capacity of us. We don't know if we're up for it, if we're up to it. 
And that's the thing we have to try to tackle. And I think that's sitting at the heart of the independence question. Um, feel free tonight to ask all the usual ones. And I'm not, tr yes, I am probably being a bit dismissive. So be as rigid as you like back about all those ones of currency, borders, deficits, you know, I mean, they're there, for sure they're there. But we're sitting with a bigger problem right in front of us. And I think if we can't shift the dial on that, we'll never get past these ones. And people hug these kind of technical problems to them, like, thank God we've got a problem with currency. Because if we didn't have something like that, we'd actually have to face up to, are we going to go on like this? Having this incredible country that we don't feel worthy of, of having? You know, because that's what it actually amounts to. So anyway, that's a long bit further than you expected with. I just want, you know, said I grew up in Belfast, but that's me. Pat. Yeah, I'm, I'm the wee one in the corner. But no, I, I, it's, this is a mixed marriage in terms of uh, podcasting because uh, my family were economic migrants <coughs> around about 1895 who nipped over from Galway and then to uh, South Shields and then up to Govan and then to Dundee. And uh, I was brought up in a Roman Catholic uh, family with a nationalist background. Again, very much related to Ireland, brought with Irish traditional music and everything like that. And I came to support Scottish independence through uh, internationalism, through socialism, and through the necessity of actually self-determination. And um, it's, it's, it's been a journey because I was a, someone who was brought up to believe, and I still do believe, that class is the most significant element that divides us. And I can see throughout, throughout history that, that the, the divisions that have taken place throughout every society have ignored class. And these divisions that are stoked, culture wars we call them now, are deliberately stoked to ensure that, the, that working class people and progressives get caught up in meaningless battles when the reality is in order to achieve what individuals can be, we have to break from the system that we're currently involved in. And I became involved in the podcast with Leslie um, about six, seven years ago, and uh, it's been an amazing journey to actually to, to take it forward. And we, we sat and spoke about this today, and we said, and Leslie mentioned the rugby, and I'll let her talk about it. In sport, in everything, it's the hope that kills you. And that's the position we're in in Scotland, is that it's the hope, the, the knowledge that there is something there that we can be a better nation, a more outward-looking nation, a more progressive nation, a nation where every child can achieve what they can be. And that's at the heart of my belief. I am not a nationalist, I'm an internationalist. And I think that the first step to achieving the, uh, what every child can be within our nation of Scotland, which is a nation, it is not a region, is self-determination. And the, where we are just now, and the whole the debate that's taking place about the Scottish leader, uh, who's going to be the leader of the SNP, and who is going to be First Minister of Scotland, I think ought to be focused on that vision of a better nation. And that's... Uh, that's my little, my little pitch there from why I'm here. And as I say, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Um, so I just, we're just wondering, uh, who, who's aware of who all the candidates yes. are in the SNP leadership, just so that we don't, you know, the loss of them. Right, you can name them. Sorry, can somebody, yeah, can you just pass that microphone back? Because actually, I heard somebody talking about Ash Sturgeon yesterday, and I thought, oh, yeah. well, see, that's not right, actually. So there's, there's Ash. I don't know her second name now. Ah, oh, you see, you're right into that. that. You're right, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Ash, um, Katie Forbes, is it? Mm -hmm. And um, the gentleman whose name. Who's that? Yourself. I. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, are people, I mean, are you following this? But you're allowed to be, you're, you're allowed not to, but I mean, it's just, it, it helps to know. Are you curious about, you know, how that is panning out, the leadership? Not really? Yes, yes. yes you are. Okay. That's <laughs> right. fine. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the thing has been that uh, the, when, when the SNP, it was a curious thing, when the SNP lost in 2014, they won. Right, so, you know, instantly, um, everybody who had suddenly realised that the old 
fault lines of Scotland, which were very much on a sort of class-based thing. It was basically Labour, Tory, you know, and, and most of Scotland. I mean, we voted out every Tory MP in 1997. Dancer, right? And I mean, that takes some doing. There was nobody with a big clipboard. It just happened all over the country. Every single one was voted out, which is quite something. And just by the by, this is the measure of it, that um, essentially the Scots have not voted Tory since 1955. So, what, were you there? <laughs> you could not, madam, you're far too youthful looking for that. But, you know, so, so the thing is, that's the, it's not just a small difference, that. Um, I, I actually did the maths for the book, I've just been finishing it, and I'd, the, the proportion of, of MPs in England who are Tory is, and I, is I think, 54%. The, perception, the percentage in Scotland is 89 it's, it's a massive difference, and it's been like that election after election. So, you know, those, that was the way... What has been happening is Scotland is essentially a social democracy in a conservative country. And it's been realising that about itself. It's been realising that through the prism, first of all, of general elections, and then realising that doesn't actually change. You, you know, you, you vote Labour, you get Tory over and over and over again. And so... That realisation came to a height in 2007 when the SNP came in, 2014. I mean, Alex Salmond, never a guy to take a slow canter at something of an absolute blooming headlong rush will do. And I'm not arguing with it. There's an ambition in that, which was kind of almost a shock to the system, to everybody. We were kind of used to slow, incremental, not getting anywhere, nothing quite <coughs> happening, gurning in the corners, you know, some. And then bang, suddenly this com guy comes in who changes the kind of font on the Scottish executive to Scottish government overnight. It's pretty frisky, actually. So suddenly we've got a government, not an assembly. Right, fine. And quickly canters into negotiations with David Cameron, who thought the idea the Scots would ever vote for independence was a laugh. So went ahead with the Edinburgh Agreement. You know the rest. We went for two years of a campaign, which seemed interminable but actually in hindsight you can see how it started to change people because we had to actually face up to a lot of stuff discussions all the rest of it 2014 big disappointment for those of us living in a bit of a social media bubble who actually thought we were going to win and actually at one point a week beforehand the polls had us pretty much 55 percent that then created quite a response from london the, the kind of avalanche of uh, MPs who were sent up the road to look like they cared. The amount of caring that suddenly happened was quite caring. Um, and so we just sort of missed it. But that then changed the fault lines of politics for good. Well, maybe not forever, but, you know, for quite a long time. So uh, nobody was going back to their normal previous divisions. Nobody was kind of going, oh, yeah, independence, that was a wee phase, but kind of we'll just go back to sitting politely in the corner and thinking that we'll vote Labour sometime in the next 400 years, we might get something close to what we want. Yeah, we'll just do that now because we'd seen a little glimpse. It's like if you get a wee glimpse, the door opens for a wee minute, you see this beautiful other country in there. It looks really pretty sunny, warm. It's not raining even. And you think, dancer, I want to go there. Door shuts. You think, well, hang on a minute. I saw that. It wasn't my blooming imagination. I saw that. And actually, as some of the folk who were around and active at the time, you've no idea how different it was in that sort of last six months with people producing creative ideas about how to move forward, going to events, and you were easily the oldest person in it when you were 32. I mean, it, it was quite extraordinary, the level of, 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 of energy that suddenly was created. And you couldn't unsee that either. You could not go back to saying, we'll just sit nicely in the corner and wait for the Tories to get knocked out by somebody. We want change in our lifetime. So that's the big change that's basically happened. That's where we still are. So everyone piled into becoming members of the SNP. I have to say, early experiences of mine suggest to me that membership of a political party should come with a pretty major health warning. And that's almost any, it's a, somebody's got to do it, I'm quite sure. But it's, you know, it's going to be disappointing. It's going to be a bit messy. But nonetheless, people who were not previously party political types horsed into the SNP. So at one point, they had 120,000 members or more. 
And actually, at that point, they were the third largest political party in Britain, never mind anything else. And I think because at that point, the leadership with Nicola Sturgeon and her husband, who should never have been able to be the chief executive, um, had a bit of a kind of controlling approach to most things and decided that this was, you know, this was pretty overwhelming. There were branches in places like Kilmarnock, if any of you know your Scotland well enough, <laughs> that had three SNP branches. Kilmarnock. I mean, that was happening all over the place, that there would be branch one, branch two, branch three, because nobody could book a hall enough, big enough, in Kilmarnock to have all the SNP members in it. You know, it was extraordinary. And I think they basically were running a movement as a political party, and all their instincts were to kind of control it. There's been too narrow a set of people controlling the direction of Scotland and the SNP and the independence movement. And that has been the difficulty to finally wend my way back to your little enthusiasm <laughs> moment at the beginning about the leadership, is that we now have a situation that what, whatever would come next would not, could not be as controlled as the last eight years have been. So as soon as Nicola Sturgeon suddenly announced she was going and nobody saw it coming, um, all the divisions, all the different personalities, the Gender Recognition Reform Act divisions that had cropped up, all sorts of stuff, suddenly, bang, they've all jumped up in our faces, including the independent strategy. Many of us have been on what seemed like endless demonstrations, you know, through Glasgow, through Edinburgh, 100,000, 200,000, nobody being paying any attention. And Every year, Nicola Sturgeon would promise next year there's going to be a referendum, and there kind of wasn't. And maybe in hindsight, there kind of wasn't ever going to be. And you know when you felt hopeful and then felt you've been, you know, made a fool of? That's a venomous reaction you can get to that kind of thing, some people. So that's where we're sitting at at the minute, with three individuals fairly randomly chosen, it would have to be said, given they just snap your fingers, it's got to be done now, nature of the moment that Nicola presented everyone with. And the other thing, and then I will shut up, is the, the fact that there is a lot of talent in the SNP essentially in the wrong parliament because the first uh, elections that happened after the independence referendum were Westminster elections. So all the folk who'd horsed in full of, you know, go and independency people and, you know, if you like some of the real deal, those guys became MPs. Some of the rule changes that came in um, under Peter Merrill as chief executive was to make it incredibly difficult for MPs to come back up to Holyrood. And that means there's quite a lot of talent that's sitting in Westminster that frankly should be up the road. Um, now, I hope whoever comes in, there will be such pressure now that these kind of things will get taken, removed. And over the next two or three years, there should be a bit more uh, of a balancing out. But I mean, there's lots more to say about that. I mean, what's, sorry, it's just difficult to do when there's only one mic floating around in the wrong place. What, what's your own interest in it? Stripey madam, or sir that's decided he's going for it. Right, well, I'm Scottish, so that's, that's my interest. Oh, yeah, that's, come on now, and what? What, what? what do you think about it? Come on. No, just, well, what, I'm sorry, I have just been speaking for a wee while there on a number of things which would give you some opportunities. I mean, you know, the leadership candidates, Nick, you know, the situation, independence, anything? You'd need the... Oh, okay. um, leadership, I would probably go for the guy and... Because he's a guy, because that's sort of, sort, of, sort of what it sounds like, since you can't name him oh, a friend, do you know what I mean? <laughs> we'll, call, we'll call him Humsa for the time being, won't yeah. we? Right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. See, that's see, totally I, I, I for. said to people, don't worry about sitting here. It's not like a comedy gig where you're going to be picked <laughs> on if you're sitting, in, sitting in the front row. But just to, to end there, what, what, what strikes me about the, hopefully, uh, it strikes me about this leadership campaign, and we've been speaking about it enormously, is that the lack of attention that's actually been paid to 
to the big issues, because there was a poll done, which is the primary issue uh, that people are facing just now is the cost of living crisis. And the recent polls have said that I think 80% of 7% of the Scottish electorate think that's the most important. Then, then comes the National Health Service. Then at 58%, it's the leadership. Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's down there. And again, something that came out today was community wealth building. I have not heard one piece of discussion about community wealth building, which is based on people might know as the, the Preston model, where actually you employ the, the purchasing power fundamentally of your institutions within a local economy, the university, the schools, the colleges, the, the, the council. And what you do is you, you, your procurement is used to develop businesses within your community. And those businesses are cooperatively owned. So that begins to build a social enterprise cooperative society within the framework of your own local community. And there's a Community Wealth Building Act. Not one question has been asked about the Community Wealth Building Act. An, inter an internal amount of focus on uh, Kate Forbes's religious perspectives and how that might influence her, if it is as likely as it becomes, I, I, I think that she will be the next First Minister. And that's the, the other thing we've got to think about. This is not just the leader of the Scottish National Party. This is going to be the First Minister of Scotland, and they're going to have that responsibility, as Leslie has said, of bringing not only the party together, but then taking forward the whole movement, because the SNP is the political representation of that broad yes movement who did place their faith in the SNP by joining in enormous numbers, but they placed their faith in that to actually chart a path that we can achieve independence. There has been talk about the vision. There has to be a narrative of what a better country can look like, and there's been a fantastic amount of focus on process. How do we get a Section 30 order? That might be wish over people's heads. The Section 30 order has to be granted by the UK government, as was done with the Edinburgh Agreement, to permit the Scottish Parliament to actually initiate a referendum. And Labour and the Conservatives have both turned around and said, you're not getting one. So much for the Union of Equals. They've got to tackle that. And it did, and, but what we have had is we're maybe starting to get these things coming through. And what is the, what are, what's Kate Forbes' economic policy? We listened to them both, remember, at the trade union meeting. And they were both, and, uh, both Ash Reagan, Hamza Youssef, and uh, Kate Forbes were talking at the trade, and they were all waxing lyrical about the trade union movement. But subsequently, Kate Forbes has come out with, well, I'm not going to raise income tax on the, the, on the, the top levels. I'm going to keep it as it is. And she talks about growing the economy in some kind of way. What is the well-being economy? How are we going to grow that economy that's fair and just to people? These are the questions that are not being asked. And what the, the candidates have been focusing on are the issues that the media have decided are important. The sexy issues. You know, the issues that are going to get a Barney and yellow and yellow warfare. And it is going to be an amazing job, I think, for anyone who takes over to actually bring the party together and then develop a strategy and a narrative creating the vision that will re-energise the movement that I felt and we all felt in 2014. And it was an incredible, inspiring time. No matter what anybody says, it was inspiring. It was not divisive. It was not divisive at all. There was debate, there was discussion amongst people that I didn't know thought about politics at all. It inspired people. It inspired people with a vision of what a better country could look like. So anyway, I think the thing is, rather than us sit and rant at you, um, what, what, yeah, let's yeah. have some questions from you. This gentleman here. Um, you oh, sorry. Uh, oh, hang on a minute, sorry. Yeah, wait, just. Yeah, we'd, we'd forgotten our original order indeed, sorry. Um, I, I don't know how much you observe our politics over here in Northern Ireland. <laughs> I've been living here over 20 years. It's so dysfunctional here. And as a feminist and a socialist and a Scot, um, I just envy so much what's happening in Scotland and what Nicola has achieved. Like she was a once in a lifetime politician. You know, mm -hmm. you'll never get someone out of the three who are coming up with her integrity, her honesty, her um, sense of responsibility. Look what happened after the salmon debacle. Look how she stood up and explained very clearly the process and where she might have gone wrong. Um, you know, she didn't shy away from things the way the Johnson government has. 
So when you're talking about, you know, you know, I'm totally for independence. I'm totally for, and that's because I see that the, pro the progressive government we've had in Scotland, you know, is, we, we kind of need to break away from England to continue with that, to get away from what's been brought to us, you know, the austerity measures and the rest. So, but, but there's a little bit of when you're talking about uh, what they'll have to sort in Scotland, I think a lot has been sorted already. So much has been achieved already. And, and we can only look on from here and think, please, can we get some action like that here? Hi. Um, so yeah. I don't really have a question, Avernan. How would you compare, if you had to compare what's been achieved in Scotland over the last eight years and what we have failed to achieve here yeah. <laughs> with our continually failing, failing government, how would you, how would you kind of balance it up? Or? Well, I was, I was, I was went on the bus out to where I live today, and it was out. Can't remember which of the roads it was, and saw a sign which said, um, uh, "Fail again, but fail better." <laughs> it's a sort of uplifting slogan, and I thought, "Yeah, that's a good one." But um, it, for sure, I mean, I quite understand people look a look across at Scotland, and you'd think, "What are you guys moaning about?" You know, you've got already more powers within Scotland because of the level of support there was in our referendum, more than Wales as well, you know. So that's absolutely all true. It's one of these things of when it comes to actually sort of just managing to muster the confidence to actually fly that moment, we problem. So, the, you know, all the powers that you've got, they surely make a bit of a difference, but there's something else that just kind of keeps holding people back. And that's kind of where we've got to now. But for sure, um, you know, the, the level of powers we've got, there's a couple of things to say about them. I mean, first of all, some of the things that have been introduced um, would actually now be finding, well, we will find it very hard to deviate from basically Westminster standards because of the Internal Market Act. Because the British government is desperate to go and get the oven-ready trade deals that strangely haven't popped out of the oven at them very easily, um, they have to present the whole of the UK as one unit, one unit with one set of standards. Now, you guys, you lucky bams, are able to yeah, have yeah. your variations because you're special. Um, Scotland voted more Remain than you if we're going to get into arm wrestling competitions, you know. So we was robbed. At the moment, politically, a lot of people are looking across the shock at Northern Ireland and thinking, you guys have got potential now. Now, I'll quite grant you there's a few large stickly bits in the middle of your potential being raised, really big ones. But the point is, the structural stuff we're dealing with, where we are just out of the U European Union, with all the problems that's causing now for every sector of the economy, you've not got that problem completely. So, it, you know, everybody can look and think that the other side has got something that is making their life potentially better. But I'll quite grant you that sitting without any likelihood of Stormont getting sitting again in the short term is utterly dispiriting. And I can quite see that people will look at Scotland looks like it's just having normal problems. I mean, I was at a Slugger O'Toole recording podcast last night and there was two gentlemen who are standing down as councillors in Belfast City Council speaking. And I just... I just asked, um, have you actually got rid of the 11 plus here yet? Right. <laughs> um, you know, I think, Michelle, I'm, again, I'm raising your blood temperature, my, my dear. But I had no idea that actually Martin McGuinness had willed the end, but not the means of how you were going to get across grammar schools. And it made me think that when we crossed the water in 1973, um, comprehensives were utterly normal. It had just, the change had just been made in Scotland. But if you went to somebody now, okay, and we've still got some issues with Catholic schools, but you know, the, the by and large experience is people go to comprehensives and they don't expect to make life-changing ch decisions for children at the age of 10 or 11. They just don't. And so it's only that little intervention and exchange and the complex transfer system that then got explained, which is like, what? That's even worse than the blimmin' 11 plus, you know what I mean? That made me suddenly realize the norms that there are, nobody's going back to anything like that level of stuff in Scotland. And that's a big, big step forward in lots of ways. 
We talked about community buyouts in an earlier thing. And this is another thing that seems important to me. I was very involved with the Island of Egg buyout. Happened in 1997, before the Scottish Parliament reconvened even. Those people had been so stuffed by successive absentee landowners, like lots of Scotland, um, and they took it into their own hands to go for a buyout. They spent years collecting the money. They got £1.56 million from members of the public. And history was made. They were the first islanders in history to buy an island back from their laird. That island is motoring now, I can't tell you. It's a small example. They've doubled their population, but they've got all sorts of good ideas have been able to come out. They've got um, an, a, an egg electric system. They used to run everything on diesel generators. They've now got a mixed off-grid system that's got hydro, that's got solar, unbelievably, for the Western Isles. Um, and uh, what's the other one? Hydro and wind. And that system actually has now got them self-sufficient. Every home has got a little monitor that sits on it. If you exceed five kilowatts of energy, you trip your house. You switch yourself off. And you have to pay to be reconnected. And in seven years, no one has paid. Because everyone has got used to limiting their use of energy. Because that's the way that that island had developed. I can't tell you how many small advances there are. But the main one is that all their own children are there, having been given plots of land for free to build houses on. They've used and started to learn the techniques of using their own timber instead of getting expensive stuff horsed in from elsewhere. They've become an island of builders, a cooperative of builders, a set of people who, once they started thinking about it, realised they could sort their own problems out by having no broadband. They set up a company which gives them now shit-hot broadband. They've gone round all sorts of other remote islands in Scotland and shown them how to do it too. And we still think we're a nation of inca incapable people. You know, the levels of capacity that there are sitting embedded in there are unbelievable. And yet, Scotland does have an extraordinarily centralised system of government. I mean, we have 32 councils in Scotland the average population is 175,000. Now, you'll say, like, I don't know, is that big, is that small? How many are there in NI? Councils? Come on, people. 11. 11 for 1.5? So that's about the same. Actually, it's sort of large here, too. But we are utter outliers in Scotland, actually, but Britain generally. Across the EU, the average size of a council is 10,000 people. And when you, when you trust people, when you think that they are a resource that you have to harness, you don't create top-down, over-large government because you flare people off. You flare people out of the system the way they used to flare gas off rigs because they didn't know what it was for. So there's lots of problems like that that we're still sitting with. Um, and I think I have definitely rambled off the point. But, I mean, you're, you're quite right that Nicola um, sits at the top as an, one of the world's best communicators. She's that good. And that when someone is good that way, it looks effortless. She reads not just the room, the room beyond the room. And for that whole period of COVID, for example, I can remember coming back to where I live in North Fife, and there was some delivery of oil or something happening. So the chap was out of his van for that. Someone behind him was out of his car wondering what was happening. The person in the house had come out to figure it all out. All of their windows were open, mine too. And at that moment, we were all listening to Nicola Sturgeon's COVID briefing. And actually, you could hear it in some of the houses coming out of their windows. The whole blinking place was listening to her. And that was quite a unifying thing. At the end of it, you might say, we didn't have a much better outcome in terms of COVID deaths. But definitely in terms of, the, of the, the constancy of a leader, when Boris was kind of, well, doing what Boris does and hardly ever appearing, you had a woman who was there every day anticipating all the questions you might ask and not patronising you, you know, actually giving you really good straight up information. So she's going to be, she's not a hard act to follow, she's an impossible act to follow, actually, in that respect. But a leader is more than just the ability to speak. And, and I mean, sure, there's, I'm not, there's, there's not being critical. There's lots of things, that are good things that have happened 
the, the Scots have been able to mitigate an awful lot of the rubbish that's come out of Westminster. So, for example, the bedroom tax, I don't know if that still happens here. Right, nice one. Well, you know, that was mitigated, I can't remember how long ago, and that's probably what all the devolved nations have done, actually, is jumped in and just taken the worst examples off. We've moved forward with the Scottish child payment. Yeah. Again, I'm looking at Quinton. I don't think that's quite happened here yet, but that's a good model. Um, even yesterday, earlier this week, we had the minimum alcohol pricing, which we're the first government in the world to have pushed forward, and it seems to have worked. Don't think anyone wants to get complacent about that because we've got big addiction problems. But you could come down a long list of policy achievements. They're absolutely there. The difficulty is that you, you know, you've, you've got to a stage where people feel we need to have a big discussion about how we get further, given that we've now hit the back wall. Because we, we're not going to get more powers. We're going to get any variations we try to apply removed through the internal market bill. Um, and life from here on in is going to get a lot tougher. And there's no strategy for independence. Big problem. Yeah. I was just about to say before we come to the gentleman here, yeah, you are, I, was, I was catching your eye there. I thought, he's actually to get in. One of the points that Leslie made is we're an incredibly centralised country. And to, to release the energy of people, you've got to decentralise. And one of the, the key points that Leslie makes in her writing is the fact that if you actually decentralise down and you give people the power and responsibility within smaller local government areas they can take charge and taking charge as we know if you give them some responsibility with support their confidence grows so in other words over centralization may make you think that you're doing the right thing but it's the wrong thing to do not just in terms of organizing and structuring the way you run your country but it's the wrong thing to do if you're going to develop the self-confidence to run your own country. It's a virtuous circle. Yeah. Percentages were mentioned earlier. Could I ask you, both of you, a question about percentages? Right? No, no. Wait. Which areas of Scotland, percentage-wise, would be the most pro-independence? And which areas of Scotland, also percentage-wise, would be least supportive of independence. And why would that be? Well, I mean, the most, the, the most uh, keen on independence were the big cities, Glasgow and Dundee. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, as a percentage, that was, the, that was where the right. percentage Perhaps, was. since I suspect we could go forwards and backwards for a while before we get the stinging barb that I sense is coming, could you <laughs> deliver it and then we know what your real point is? I mean, because, I mean, you know, there's no, if you want to argue about precise percentages, there was, I think, you know, there was above 50% in both Glasgow and Dundee at the NDREF. That was 10 years ago. Sorry? Gl Glasgow and Dundee, the city, those two big working class cities, if you like. But, you know, I think there's, and the places that are least keen are, if you like, the rural areas, Orkney and Shetland were the least, the borders were also the least. Uh, these are also the places that have, have stayed with Tory MPs, some of them, and then Lib Dem MPs up in Orkney and Shetland. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> well, I mean, my lot come from Orkney, sort of originally, and um, I mean, a lot of those islands, uh, this actually comes back to the earlier point about centralisation, because, I mean, Orkney and Shetland basically don't want anybody Edinburgh or London running their lives. And they're quite right, actually. So the, the way they have manifested that is essentially, um, you know, just to, to kind of say, all of your attempts to run us, we're not interested. And the Orcadians and Shetlanders were very clever in the last independence referendum by get, combining with the Western Isles to sort of play off the two governments and saying, which one of you is going to give us a better package of powers? Um, which, you know, you've got to take your moments and try to win something out of it. Um, but this is not the best way to be running policy. The whole of Scotland needs decentralised. I mean, we're sitting with the largest local authority, their reg regional authorities, the largest in Europe. And nobody regards that as a political issue, but it manifests itself these ways. Pe people don't want to be run by an urban centre. 
And there's countries, you know, like Norway, for example. One of the reasons Norway isn't in the European Union is that when they had two referendums, there was a 70% vote to join the EU in Oslo and a 70% not to join in the rest of rural or Norway. And since Norway is such a dispersed country, there's more of them out of Oslo than in Oslo. And so a very progressive country that's always had a strong history of being internationalist is not in the EU, much to the annoyance of the guys in Oslo. So there's always that, there's that pattern in many countries where you've got to really work hard to bring the entire lot with you. And the reverse of that is if you're asking about the, why such a strong support in Glasgow or Dundee, my analysis is because these were traditional working class areas that were committed to the vision of a post-war settlement of what Britain could be. They felt betrayed, they felt betrayed particularly by the, the Blair government, and they felt betrayed by the, the neoliberal drift that had been going on since Margaret Thatcher. And the Labour Party failed to change that. We continually sent Labour MPs down to Westminster and they were the feeble 56. Nothing happened. So there was a sea change. And I remember talking to friends of mine in the Labour Party who thought that 2014 and the loss of the referendum by the Yes Moon would signal the defeat of the Scottish National Party and that was it. And we saw what happened in the first general election after that. Labour, who had been had a hegemony in Scotland, wiped out completely. They have one solitary MP in Scotland, Ian Murray, who is elected by Conservatives. And we see that going on local government where there, there are alliances and coalitions, this might work here, Starmer says, between, uh, between Conservatives and Labour, based on the constitutional divide, not on not on ideology in terms of class or issues like that, but on the, on the constitutional divide. So Dundee and Glasgow switched, and they, I can't, cannot see them going back to Labour, particularly a Labour party run by Keir Starmer. Jeremy Corbyn, I could have seen, but it didn't happen under Corbyn. If it didn't happen under Corbyn, it ain't going to happen under Keir Starmer. So that was it. People who are left of centre, who still adhere to what Britain was post-1945, with the welfare state and the policies that were introduced switched completely from Labour to the SNP and they ain't going back. Does that satisfy you, sir? Was there anything you wanted to come, you know, I don't want to leave you feeling bereft just because your microphone's moved two <laughs> seats to the left. You're all right, good. Okay, that's fine. Right, yes. Where did it go now? Hi. Hi, yeah, I'm, um, just on that whole notion of um, I guess radicalism is what you were starting to talk about there. And um, I, moved, uh, I moved to Glasgow just after the 2014 referendum, and I had just happened to be, this wasn't by choice, it wasn't like a premeditated um, outcome. I moved to Nicola Sturgeon's constituency. <laughs> and actually, one of the things that I would like to say, I mean, I, I totally agree with her, yeah, everyone lauding her, her leadership abilities and, uh, and her skills at... Um, at that sort of big outlook. But one of the first things I did in uh, Govan Hill was just visit a local community centre, which just so happened that Nicola Sturgeon was there doing a, a surgery. And what was really amazing, I mean, I'd come up from, I'd, I moved up from Brighton to Glasgow and I'd seen Nicola on the television, you know, big, you know, lots and lots of coverage. And she turned up at this community centre with no entourage, and she knew, you know, come in Annie, she knew all the really local people. That's a really, that was an amazing skill that I noticed with her. But anyway, radicalism is what I wanted to talk about because when I moved there at that time, I still felt that spirit that, that Leslie was talking about. It was still there, there was like an aftermath almost. And I went and I attended some local meetings and what have you. And I'm just curious to know why, why I mean, my perception is that it sort of fizzled out and, um, and I've got my own opinions and thoughts around why that might have happened, but I just wanted to, to gather yours, really, um, and uh, see whether they match up. If anybody actually goes running here, have you ever um, noticed that phenomenon that as soon as you get somewhere near your front door, you actually can't run another inch? You know, like your, your mind and your abilities are very governed by the distance of what you're expecting of yourself. And when you think you've arrived at your destination, you just stop. Now the problem for Scots is we've been running for 10 years 
we thought, we thought this was going to be a six-month canter to the line, you know, and then it would be maybe another year, and then it would probably be another year. And actually, we've gone on and on and on like this. Personally speaking, I have never stopped going around doing talks around Scotland. Not Well, actually, during COVID, during which time I made two films which are online about Estonia and the Declaration of Our Broth. Um, there's, in fact, if you want to have a look at the films, there's ones about Norway, Iceland, the Faroes, the point being to try to say to Scots, look at the little countries around us that have almost, with the exception of Norway, none of the energy advantages that Scotland's got, and just, you know, look at where they've got to. I'm not saying we can copy those guys overnight. No, we can't. I'm not saying they are a prescription for exactly what will be. No one will ever be. I'm just saying, we need more stories and comparisons in our lives than the ones we've got in front of us. And for a lot of Scots, it's also been 10 years of self-education by gum. At the beginning of this, this is a bit like at the beginning, you could roughly point to a car and know it was different from a motorbike. And at the end of it, you can talk about camshafts with authority. It's been extraordinary. The, the level of blooming detail everybody's had to get into, you'll have had the same here but all to the purpose of we're going to drive that car one day soon. And then the difficulty is it's not this year, then it's not the next year, and then it's not the next. And it's quite hard to keep your pecker up when you've not got a front door in perspective. You don't know when you're going to end. So actually, there's been yes groups formed all over Scotland, just autonomous yes groups that have quietly been beavering away. And there has, you know, we had big rallies. There were 200,000, I can remember, going through Glasgow, a particularly Driech one, where it was absolutely pelting down, raining, and it got to the stage everyone was so... There's still the, the images online of everyone under the Helaman's umbrella, if you know your Glasgow well enough. Actually, by that stage, Druk it, just dancing literally in the rain with bagpipes, everything. It was a beautiful thing. Got no coverage at all. So how would you know whether we're doing something or not? And that's why I've been part of a little group that realizes how invisible we are. And it's maddening when people sort of tell you, well, we're not really seeing you do anything. And you think, oh my God, I've done nothing for the last 10 years with this damn thing and nobody sees an outcome. Um, but we've got to realize that what we're doing is often not impactful. So for example, I was part of a little group that organized an event on the Supreme Court verdict day because we would have an impact that day. It's in the news. But to your wider point, um, we had a wee conversation before, and actually I put a tweet out today saying, why is Scotland not doing something like this Imagine Belfast Festival? Because we're not doing some of the stuff that needs to be done, which is just to gather, create focuses for political debate like this. And you're absolutely right. I'll be going back home, getting a wee posse together and seeing what we can get organized. But I think the, you know, the basic answer to it is, we started off, I mean, my dad was quite an athlete. He got bumped from the Olympics in 1944 by a chap, Bannister. He was that good. He'd spike shoes in the lot. You know, I was always a bit of a disappointment. So he was a guy who did, you know, short sprinting r runs. Um, he ended up running marathons. And this is what's happened to us. We thought we were doing a relative middle distance run and we're still plodding away, you know, kind of two, 26 kilometers later. And it drains you. Uh, you guys know what being drained is like. You're being drained all the time with the hope that stuff's gonna this time come round, that somehow, you know, not trying to get too deeply into this because one always worries you, somebody's gonna take a, you know, exception to how you put it. But, you know, are you going to get a storm on out of this? Are you going to have a democracy? Are you going to be just tagging along with the European research group for the rest of your lives? Is one small party's intransigence able to kind of act as a block on all of you? It wears you down. And believe me, that's what we have in common. We've spent 10 years sort of not quite getting enough lift off to lift off. And you've got to get to a stage where you do get somewhere because otherwise your children leave. And this is the thing that still governs me. This is my like waking nightmare, is that the next, if, if anyone of a certain age, and you'll have the same, says to you, should I stay here? What do you say? You know, so we, this is what drives me onwards, but we, that's why we need to have a strategy to get further. And at the moment, 
notwithstanding Nicola's many, many sort of talents, we actually, and it could be that nobody could find one, but in that case, what the heck are we going to do? The Sturgeon government had focused on the independence campaign for the last eight years. They would have been slated for neglecting social issues. You know, there has to be a balance. It has to be about people campaigning on the ground, surely, surely. Yes, it does have to be. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone's asked which candidate you're rooting for, if you could maybe come to that. Later. None of the above. None of the above. Uh, I, I've said it quite clearly. If I had the option, I would vote for Stephen Flynn who is the leader at Westminster. Why? He's young, he's articulate, he's the next generation. Uh, I'm going to slip in something here, otherwise they'll kill me for it. He's a Dundee United supporter, but that's a matter of it. But he's a trade unionist, he's a socialist, and he comes from that background. I think he speaks to the generation. And before we get too down, if you actually look at the demographics, we're looking at percentages, if you get under 55, we've got it. We've got it. The demographics are on our side. But we are placed within what is claimed to be a union of equals and is very definitely not. We are trapped because of the fact of the refusal of the two main political parties. They're, they're working together to say no. And, if you can, and they are hoping at some point that we'll get tired of hitting our head against the brick wall of a section of 30 no. It, but that is not going to happen. But it is incredibly wearing. And we've spoken about this. I mean, the, the, the fact is you're constantly talking about things, constantly talking, trying to get there. And no, no. And it is the attempt that someone is going to have to make to break through that. And I totally agree. What you've got to do, I think, is run a government that shows what the potential of a new Scotland could be like, while simultaneously engaging in a strategy to achieve independence. The two have got to go together. But it has been driven by the Yes movement. I mean, I, 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 I banged on internally about the Scottish, the SNP media rebuttal group, which was a particular bugbear of mine. People were paid in London to sit and go and theoretically rebut everything that came out from the, from the media and to answer it quickly and to fire that to MPs, MSPs, and that would be out there. And I watched slowly but surely as nothing happened. Nothing happened, but people were being paid and they didn't do what they were meant to do. And it was left to individuals who they then retweeted to actually take that on board. And that's what's happened. It's people like Leslie, it's people like uh, Business for Scotland, Time for Scotland, people like that. And the, these yes groups that have been going out and continually campaigning. But for goodness sake, we need the major political party in Scotland, which supports independence, to actually, you know, support the, the, the yes movement. And we need to work together on that. Um, it's a strange thing, this, to find yourself... I mean, I, I was just saying to Quentin, who I know very well, um, that I feel at the moment as if I have an array of arrows, darts and various other sharp implements in my back all the time from the things I've said which are actually trying to uphold Nicola Sturgeon's actual legacy. At the moment, within a lot of the Yes movement, that is... That's too hard to hear. Um, so it's, a, it's an unusual event to be sort of having the suggestion that you feel I'm not being warm enough <laughs> to Nicola, right? But look, damn the breaks, right? And it's a real insight. I, I always find this when I go abroad. I remember going to Iceland where Nicola had gone to speak at the Arctic Circle event. I run a wee policy group called Nordic Horizons that's been taking speakers over to speak in the Scottish Parliament for the last 12 years. So I, I'm in Iceland quite a bit. Anyone been to Iceland? They're fucking, what are they like? They're just, yeah, just the very donkey, actually. And actually, if any of you go, guys go, you would be so in because they love Irish people. 40% of their DNA, they think, is totally Irish. It's actually Irish and Scottish. And there's a wee... Well, yes, not for the best reasons at all, because they carried women off to basically be, you know, colonised and slaves and, you know, all the rest of it. But anyway, 40% DNA is Celtic, which they think is Irish, although the Scottish islands were subject to exactly the same. But because we're not a country, we can't be seen conceptually. So actually, when you're in a taxi in, in Iceland, or if you need anything in Iceland, I just flip back to being Irish because you get a much quicker response, you know. <laughs> but the, the Icelanders um, are a kind of interesting bunch. Um, 
who, do you know, I shouldn't have taken that random section away. I've forgotten where I was going. It was Nicola's speech there. So she was speaking to the Arctic Circle, 2,000 delegates from all over the world. She was one of the keynote speakers in 2016, along with Ban Ki-moon, who was the General Secretary of the UN. Um, Nicola absolutely blew everyone away. And I, mean, I knew a lot of these Nordic women. They're, you know, Nordic women politicians are pretty blooming formidable in their own right. And they were absolutely overwhelmed by her. At the end of it, there was a queue out the door to meet Nicola Sturgeon, and Ban Ki-moon was standing on his own. So I'll quite give you, she's had this absolutely huge effect. For everywhere else you go, she's got almost like a Scottish terrier-like working class, slight lady die meets something else thing going on because there's some sort of presence she's got which actually gets people quite excited. Um, so I'll say all of that is true. However, um, we need a strategy on independence. And, you know, if we have to kind of bring it out like a sort of dirty, embarrassing secret from under the table, mm, we're not really going to get very far. And I'll quite grant you it's a difficult one to do, but that's the job that people have signed up for when they become an SNP leader, I'm afraid. Um, it's also the case that I do slightly disagree on this notion that the competent government, of course, you know, I'm not saying we want incompetent government, but... Let's just look at something which Nicola hugged to herself. She said, judge me on education and removing the attainment gap, which is the gap, you know, for, between working class people of whatever, managing to get into universities and so on. And the thing is, so much about education is determined by poverty. So, you know, you've got people struggling with outcomes because, mm, maybe, because they have got, you know, they're sitting in crushing generational poverty and the hands on the levers to do something about that seriously, apart from the mitigations which we're all reduced to, this is all we get to do is kind of the pens at that angle, not that angle, that's not enough. So if you hug that to yourself and say, judge me on education, well, for sure you can do it better or worse, and I've already had a bit of a go at, I'm still waiting for somebody to come back and have a, let's have the 11 plus everywhere argument. No, okay. Um, you know, but you've got to acknowledge that when you're in a United Kingdom, when you're in a British system where a lot of, of what you're trying to mitigate and fix is driven by, you know, by Westminster, you can't say that education is going to be sorted on your watch. And uh, this is a, 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 a tilt that Nicola has taken, is to sort of suggest that nearly everything can be sorted. And that was to contrast with Alex Salmond, who was perceived by many people to be a sort of grudge finder, you know, if there was a way to sort of have a battle with, with Westminster, it's your fault, that would be his general tilt. Now, that's also unfair about Alex. The only reason that Britain is actually anywhere at all in terms of renewable energy was Alex Salmon's championing of wind energy when the British government, and it's still the case, they've got a, uh, they've got a presumption against any wind developments on, on shore, Right? The, the planet is going to hell in a handcart and we've still got, and they're opening a new coal mine. Ha, nice. The constancy, the on-off switch of, ener of control of energy is Westminster's shout. And at that shout, we've sometimes got community energy that's on, then it's off. We've got sometimes a tiny bit of exploration money for tidal energy, which could be the next huge game changer. It's a big one for actually Northern Ireland, you know, with MCT down at Strangford Loch, although they had their problems. But that's the point. You have problems with new technology. They need mega funding. And you don't get that with a government that thinks it's going to somehow fix everything by setting up more nuclear energy stations, power stations, that it can't interest a single company in the city of London in investing in. So the point I'm trying to say is, again, there's only so much you can do when you don't have control. And that's something that somebody needs to be able to constantly showcase. We've done this much. We, we got the profile of renewable energy we've got in Scotland through planning law. You know, so it needs to be beefier than that. And the trouble is, every time you just don't need to just quite bring out the independence card, it actually tells people that we're doing all right as it is. Why do you need independence if you'd be so competent? So it's a tough, tough one. I mean, I would hate to do this, you know, that job, but that's what it calls for. Hi. 
Yeah, so I'm actually Scottish and I live in Scotland and I just happen to be in Belfast tonight. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but one of the, <clears throat> the question I want to ask you is that I, um, I find it hard sometimes to find positive things about Scotland in the media. And, you know, I sometimes look at the national, which is probably the exception, but certainly um, there's not much positive about independence in, you know, most of the mainstream Scottish media. And that is a huge influencer, obviously, on the Scottish people. And the associated thing as well, I think, is that so many of our opinion formers, even outside the, me the media and industry and in other places, are actually non-Scots as well. And I think it, so I'd be interested to hear your comments on, on how that all plays through. Well, I, I write, write two newspaper columns, one for the National, one for the Herald. And uh, to be honest, I've, I don't think I've met a person yet that's read a Herald column I've written. Because actually, newspapers, as you may find here as well, are sort of almost on their way out. Um, now, that's not to say they haven't got a, the decision-making um, role. And that very largely is the BBC. Yeah. Because what tends to happen is the Beeb is very nervous about looking opinionated, so it brings opinion formers on to have a wee tussle, and then the choice of who that, how that gets framed up is important, because how you're framing the spectrum of opinion, well, to me, it's not really Times Radio and GB News or whatever. You know, those are just kind of both very right-wing. <laughs> But if that's how the Beeb frames up a discussion, then that's what people subliminally think is the middle of where political discourse lives. And that's what's tending to happen is in as much as it's not so much that you, you know, anything that you actually write in a newspaper that I think forms an awful lot of opinion. A lot of the headlines, I'll grant you, there's days where I look at the Herald and just think, jings, you know, there's just every single story is a problem with the Scottish government. And yet, what would you say they're supposed to do? Um, you know, it's hard, it, there, there is, the, the, the mission for a newspaper is to pick holes. And you could say that the, the great um, achievement of, of, an, of de devolution is that, is that Scottish papers that used to um, have international wings and in fact, whose front pages used to be simply what was happening in Westminster are now focusing completely on Scotland as the domain of importance. Now, that's probably going a little bit far trying to see a bright side out of it. I'll grant you that. But I think it's the broadcasters who are the ones that, by importing newspaper columnists, are keeping a very sort of cynical and sort of despairing air on everything. And that's a very hard one to counteract, actually. Um, because also the other thing is the yes side of things relies on activism. And, and so a lot of those marches, for example, were never covered. I actually got phone calls from BBC producers asking me, um, is there, do you know, is there a no march going on somewhere? And I said, well, I kind of probably wouldn't really know about that. And they said, well, we can't cover your march unless there's a no march. So that you can't have an expression of activism about independence unless there's an ex expression of activism about unionism. That's not the way it works. You know, I'm... Unionism works in boardrooms. It's very much an influencer. It's very organized within, you know, if you like the great and the good. It doesn't need to have 200,000 people out in the streets. An aspiring nationalism needs the songs. It needs the bodies. It needs the optimism. It needs the visibility. It needs the streets. It's all you've got. A defensive nationalism, which is the one that's got something already and doesn't want it taken away, it doesn't need to do any of that. It just needs to get a lot of buy-in from opinion formers. So you're never going to have an equivalence the way that the BBC is sitting waiting to chalk up. So that's all a problem. And I realize I never answered your thing about candidates either. Sure, thanks for coming. Happy yep. trails. Thank you. Yeah, we will thanks indeed wind up any minute soon because we should be finished. But, I mean, I've got to say to you, I know this is disappointing, it's not in my nature to bottle it. I am not going to say, you know, which candidate, because, because the trouble is we've got to manage to pull this together after it. Yeah. Um, I have to say that when I heard Kate Forbes make her comments right at the beginning about, uh, about her kind of lack of belief in gay marriage, um, I did tweet at the time that I actually sat down and cried, and I did. Because um, 
you know, we can, we're not going through this whole discussion, or, well, you can if you want, but um, I, I quite take her word that she doesn't think she's going to try and roll back the rights that already exist. It was the kind of quite brusque way that it was put, yeah. uh, without prefacing it, that actually there'll be lots of my friends, my colleagues listening who are in marriages, who will find this hard for me to hear perhaps. But, and this is just for my own instincts, all of those things are the things Nicola would have got right. Because how you present an argument is how you manage to, you know, place yourself in it. And Kate just didn't take the time to do it. Um, so I worry a lot about that. Um, and I, I get the feeling that Scotland, having had a profile through Nicola of being pretty much at the cutting edge of most human rights progressive stuff in the whole of Britain, could see itself somehow further back. And just as a wee example, a friend of mine who works for one of the UK papers and I were talking about this and she said, you know, I can't quite believe that I'm about to interview a candidate to become the leader of the SNP and ask her if she believes in dinosaurs. And actually that's, but that's the gobsmacking place we've come to. How, how can we? So uh, that's my difficulty there with Kate, but I quite see that for a lot of people, she is Nicola reborn. She's sassy, she doesn't give a toss, she's out there despite her whole free church thing, tearing a strip off the opposition. She's using every technique to win. That one that Scots have got a big problem with, winning. Is she winning at all costs? Does it matter to her too much if she's torn the party up? That would be a question, but for a lot of Scots, they just admire that and they think, do you know, she's like Nicola, exactly like Nicola was, because she's formidable. And if she scares me, point her at the Tories. And that's the reason that she's getting support. So, you know, it's, it's impossible to say where we're going to be on Monday, but it's, we're going to have to work back again to pull this all together. And we will, because yes. there's just no way back, actually. Um, and I think that that's, that's a fantastic way to end. We work with what we've got, because that's all we've got. And the hope won't kill us. The hope's still there. And uh, I genuinely believe otherwise we, I wouldn't be doing events like this. I wouldn't continue to work with Leslie doing the podcast if I didn't genuinely believe there was a better Scotland at the end of it. And uh, just keep on keeping on. And thank, I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming out tonight. And, 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 and really enjoyed listening to you. And I hope you enjoyed listening to us. So thanks very much. Thank you.